Good morning and welcome to Word and Spirit. I'm Pastor Mark Brand coming to you live this morning from our campus at Hillcrest Church right here in the heart of Dallas, Texas. Wherever you're watching across the Metroplex, whether you're up north or out west, down south, east, or if you're watching from some other country via the internet, I'm so glad you've taken the time to spend these moments with me together in God's Word. I want to encourage you to pick up the phone and call that number at the bottom of your screen right now if you have a special prayer request because before we go off the air today, we're going to pray together concerning your needs. 972-392-3992 is the number to call or you can send an email to wordandspirit at hillcrestchurch.org. Word and Spirit at hillcrestchurch.org. And before we go off the air today in this live broadcast, we will take your request to God. Great things happen when we pray. Some people think that prayer is just a psychological catharsis, that it's a way of getting things off your chest in private that you cannot say in public or you don't feel comfortable talking about in public. And it is true that talking to God in secret often relieves you of some of the need to talk about some of the things in public, and that can be a very good thing, a very healthy thing. I've discovered when I read the book of Psalms that every emotion I might ever experience, I can find illustrated there in something that David or the other psalmist has written as they express themselves to the Lord. So that can give you a form of relief. It's a good practice, especially for a spiritual leader, because there are things you need to talk to God about that you do not need to talk to people about. But prayer is much more than simply a psychological or mental outlet. Prayer, as one wise man put it many years ago, is a means of touching the heart of the one who holds the world in his hand. When we pray, God hears us. The Bible teaches us that his ears are open to our cry. And when we pray and he hears us, then he's able to intervene on our behalf. And I do not fully understand why God has created the world in such a way that he limits some of his actions in the world to only responding to human prayer. But that's the clear teaching of Scripture, that there are some things God will not do until we ask him to do. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. So we must ask according to his will. We must ask according to the revelation of himself that he has given us in his word. We must ask in faith, believing that he can and that he will hear our prayer. And then we ask in confidence that he's a great God, he's a good God, he's a loving God, that he will do what we need him to do and he will do the best thing at the best time and in the best way. You can trust God to do what is best with the things you take to him in prayer. So I encourage you to pick up the phone and call that number. We have some wonderful things coming up here at Hillcrest Church. And before we go into the word of the Lord today, I want to give you a heads up about one particular means that we can be a blessing to you that's coming up very soon through what we call Financial Peace University. One of the leading experts on personal finance in the world today, a man whose program is shown and also heard over the air here in Dallas, Texas, named Dave Ramsey. Dave lives in Nashville, Tennessee, but he has a syndicated radio program that crisscrosses the nation and goes around the world. He's written some great books. This fall, again here at Hillcrest Church on Wednesday night, we're going to be offering the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University Seminar every Wednesday night this fall at 7 p.m. Now that begins in the month of September on Wednesday, September 10th. And I want to tell you that Dave's advice and his concepts and his teaching are not only tremendously entertaining, he's a very engaging speaker. You will enjoy this ministry, but he charts a very simple path forward. You know, one of my dear friends, a man who for many years served me as a pastor named Dennis Slavens up in Kansas City, often has made the statement that success is the product of good decisions. Failure is the result of bad decisions. And I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter how messed up your life is. The road to success 
is to make one good decision at a time. The way out of where you are is to make a series of good decisions. Now, you, your finances may be in catastrophe. They may be completely out of order. I promise you, Dave Ramsey is not going to offer some kind of a quick fix that's unrealistic, but he will give you a roadmap to follow. He'll show you what decisions you need to make in your situation. And if you make those one after another, if you'll do what you need to do, then God will do what only he can do. Years ago, I know a couple living in a northern state, actually in the state of Ohio, who were attending a church in a city there, and they had made some really bad decisions, the way sometimes young couples do. When they started off in their marriage, they tried to immediately have everything their parents had after many years of marriage. They were trying to keep up with the Joneses, and you know that can get you in trouble. The real paradox of American society is we spend money we don't have buying things we don't need to impress people we don't even like. <laughs> they were trying to keep up with the Joneses. Their outgo quickly exceeded their income, and so their upkeep was rapidly becoming their downfall. And in the church where they pastored, unknown to them, there was a wealthy individual that had great compassion for them and realized this young couple have amassed such a mountain of unsecured credit card debt that it will take them a lifetime to dig their way out of this hole. And if they do that, then they, they'll be starting so late on retirement and the ownership of a home and so forth that they have already mortgaged their entire financial future. And that wealthy individual who was an elderly man had been praying for this young couple, unknown to them. And he had asked the Lord to show him what he could do. And in his heart, he developed a conviction that he should offer to completely eliminate this young couple's debt, to write them a check, and with the stroke of a pen, set them free from that bondage. He came up to them one day after a service, and he just said casually, you know, I've been praying for you. I've heard you mention in our services, it was a small church, and people would do what's called give-in prayer requests. They would stand up during the prayer time and say, I'd like the rest of this church family to pray for this or that. And he said, I've heard that you have a real financial need, and and I've been praying for you, believing God for a miracle. He did not tell them that he was thinking about paying off their debt. He just told them the truth that he had been praying for them, asking God to help them break free from that bondage. And then he asked what we might call the $64 million question. And I don't know the exact figures, but it quite well could have been a $64,000 question in reality. He said, if someone were to pay off your debt today, what would you do differently tomorrow? And that young wife looked back at him, having no idea the import or the impact of her words. And she said, well, you know, really, I guess the truth is, if somebody paid off our debt today, we'd probably go back in debt tomorrow. And the man said, you know, man, I'm really sorry to hear that, and I'll be praying for you. And he walked away, went to the pastor, and said, I don't want you to ever tell that young woman but in that moment, I knew I should not write them that check. Why? Because they had made many bad decisions to get to where they were, and they weren't prepared to begin making different decisions in order to get to where they needed to be. Someone has rightfully said that the best definition of insanity around is the belief that if you do what you've always done, you're going to get something different than what you've always had. But Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace Seminar can help you chart a path to a different financial future. It's going to begin on Wednesday nights here at Hillcrest Church on September 10th at 7 p.m. There's a cost to go through this course. It's $125. And I tell you, that's one of the best things you could ever do is spend this money. We're not making money off of this. We're using this to cover the materials and the costs of providing you this course. But we have a special Sunday morning preview coming up that you can attend free of charge. Sunday morning, August 24th at 10 a.m. That's 30 minutes before the start of our Sunday morning worship service here at Hillcrest Church, one half mile south of LBJ on Hillcrest Road. We're having a free preview of the Dave Ramsey course. I encourage you to come. Here's a little clip of what Dave Ramsey's all about. Watch this with me, and then when we come back, 
we're going to gather into God's Word. Here's Dave Ramsey, Financial Peace University. I'm pretty normal. Sure, I've got some debt. I make a decent living. Food is on the table. House, car. Got him. Got him. Got him. I thought if I could afford the payment, then I was okay. My whole paycheck. Gone. 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 And I didn't know where to turn. Then I heard about financial peace. Now I've got a plan for my money. I took control. Financial peace. Live like no one else. Get on the road to financial peace. Sign up today for this life-changing program. So that starts on Wednesday night, September 10th, right here at Hillcrest Church in the context of what we call our Community Discipleship Ministry, where we have classes that teach practical principles from God's Word that will change your life. I also want to give you a heads up that coming up Labor Day Sunday, that's the last Sunday in August, Sunday after next, we have our annual Labor Day celebration. We do it on a Sunday. We have a special Sunday morning worship service where all the children join us. You can come casual. We'll be doing some things to involve them in the service. It's a lot of fun. Following that, we have a meal, and then we have all kinds of crafts and fun activities on our campus following the service. I look forward to seeing you there. I've been talking with you from God's Word, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, about the way that the Holy Spirit works powerfully and personally in each one of our lives. We've been talking about the supernatural or sometimes what we call the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit. You'll recall we've said there are different kinds of gifts. In fact, the New Testament uses three different Greek words for gift. There are some things that are gifts from God in the sense that they come from Him and they're a blessing to our lives, like the gift of salvation or natural talents or endowments that we may have. And then there are supernatural gifts, two words in Greek for those gifts. One is the word that Paul uses in the first verse of chapter 12 when he says, now concerning spiritual gifts, or the New Living Translation says, the special abilities that the Spirit gives to each one of us The emphasis there is on supernatural things. Paul says, now concerning these supernatural gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant or lack understanding. And then 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and 14 develop fully this idea of how God works supernaturally through His Spirit in response to human need. I want to wrap up a little thought that we've been dealing with all through last week, asking the question, how do we know if something supernatural comes from God. Because any time we start talking about the supernatural, when we start talking about things that God does that people can't do, things that God sometimes do, do, does, excuse me, that go beyond the realm of ordinary human experience, especially if you've not had a background in these things, or if you've had a background in the supernatural, but it's been the occult, All kinds of question marks can come up in your mind. Even red flags can go up saying, whoa, I'm not sure I want to be a part of anything supernatural or I want to be sure that anything supernatural I'm a part of really comes from God. Now, the Apostle Paul understood the importance of answering that question because he began chapter 12 by saying, you Corinthians, the people reading his letter, remember how before you got saved, you were led astray by demonic forces working through mute idols. And so now I want to tell you right up front that what I, the Apostle Paul, am talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is not the same thing that you experienced before you got saved. That was especially important regarding one of the key gifts that Paul was going to talk about in 1 Corinthians 14. That was the ability supernaturally to speak in a language you've never learned because the Corinthians were familiar with an occult satanic imitation of that good and godly gift that took place on the island of Delphi where there was someone known as the Oracle of Delphi, the city of Delphi. This was a temple where pagans would go and they would pay a sum of money and a prophetess would go into a trance be possessed by a demonic spirit and they would mutter unintelligible syllables and if you'd pay enough money there would be a priest that would copy down these unintelligible sounds and then supposedly give you the interpretation of what it meant. Now that was satanic fortune telling. That was witchcraft. Whether it was phony or whether it was truly supernatural 
it was clearly satanic in origin. It was false. It was not true. And Paul knew that Satan had done that in order to counterfeit the genuine gift of speaking in unknown languages that took place on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the people who were in what we call the upper room. And as the Holy Spirit filled that place, they began to speak in languages they had never learned. And a crowd came together. Great things took place. Many people got saved that day. And then later through the book of Acts, frequently as people were filled with the Holy Spirit, they began to speak in other languages. The Apostle Paul knew that the Corinthians had been exposed to a, to a satanic counterfeit of that gift, and so he wanted to be sure that they understood what he was talking about and what was taking place in the Christian church at Corinth was not the same thing as what they had experienced at the Oracle of Delphi in another pagan context. And so he gives some practical principles. Let me summarize those for you today and kind of wrap this up and then tomorrow we'll move in another direction and talk about some of the specific ways that the Holy Spirit can help us supernaturally know, say, do, and be things that God wants us to know, say, do, and be that we cannot be without supernatural help because that's what the gifts of the Spirit are all about. Now, if you're taking notes, here's the first statement I want you to write down. Number one, not everything supernatural comes from God. Not everything supernatural comes from God. You need to understand that right up front. Paul wanted to make sure that the people at Corinth that had come to know Jesus and were following him understood that there is a God side and a satanic side to the supernatural and they're not the same. Not everything supernatural comes from God. Now, God is far greater than Satan. And the Bible teaches us clearly in the book of Revelation that the day is going to come that God is going to cast Satan into a lake of fire. God is going to bind Satan forever. He will be cast into a place that is called the bottomless pit. God's going to deal with Satan. You know, that's always been a question that people have asked. Back in Daniel Defoe's classic, Robinson Crusoe, the good man Friday asked Robinson, Robinson, why doesn't God judge Satan? The answer to that question is this, God will judge Satan. I have a friend of mine who is a minister of the gospel, what we call an apostolic minister, a spiritual father, travels all over the world ministering widely. And one day his little girl asked him the question out of the blue, Daddy, is God bigger than the devil? And my friend looked back at his daughter. I think she was about eight years old. And he said, well, honey, if you're asking me whether or not God is stronger or more powerful than the devil, then the answer is yes. God is bigger than the devil. And then she said, well, why doesn't God just kill the devil? <laughs> now, maybe you've asked that question. There have been a few times in my life when I was dealing with the enemy or I was ministering to people that were bound by the power of the enemy. I became so angry at Satan. That would have been the cry of my heart. God, why don't you just destroy the devil? The answer is one day God is going to do with the devil what all of us wish God would do with him. He's going to cast him into a bottomless pit forever and ever. But in the meantime, we have this precious, powerful promise from God. Although everything supernatural does not come from God, we do not need to fear those things that are supernatural that come from Satan because greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. One of the most powerful, simple principles in God's word, a promise in the word of God is this. And I quote, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In the name of Jesus, if you love and know Jesus, you can stand against him, resist him, take authority over him, and he has to go. Not everything supernatural comes from God. That which is from God is far greater and more powerful than that which is from the enemy. Here's the second statement I want you to write down today. After that first, not everything supernatural comes from God. Number two, anything supernatural that comes from God will glorify Jesus. Anything supernatural that comes from God will glorify Jesus. 
What do I mean by that word glorify? I mean it will honor Jesus. It will exalt Jesus. It'll make Jesus seem big to you. It'll make Jesus seem more wonderful to you. Anything supernatural that comes from God will glorify Jesus. Here's principle number three. Anything supernatural that comes from God will point people to Jesus. Now, sometimes the reality of it is that there are human beings that are used by God supernaturally and they lack wisdom in the exercise of their gift, as we might say. They may carry a genuine anointing from God, but as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's possible for there to be a genuine manifestation of the Holy Spirit in a context where things happen that confuse an audience or cause people to question whether or not what is going on is really of God. But you need to understand the heart of God, anytime there's a supernatural manifestation of the Holy Spirit, is to point people to Jesus. Sometimes God works outside the realm of our prior experience. Sometimes God works outside the realm of our comfort. To be quite honest with you, I've seen the Holy Spirit do things that my human heart and mind wished He had not done. I've seen the Holy Spirit use people that if He had asked me, I'd have said, God, don't use. Why is that? Because of principle number four, anything supernatural that comes from God will meet human need. God cares so much about meeting human need that sometimes He will use unwise people. Sometimes He will use context and places that we might wish He would not use. But He does that in order to draw people to Jesus and in order to meet human need. Dr. E.V. Hill, who's now gone to be with the Lord, who pastored the great Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church in Los Angeles, California, is one of the greatest preachers that I've ever heard. I remember the occasion that I heard him preaching in a very unusual context. I heard it via cassette tape. It was actually as he preached his own wife's funeral, one of the most moving messages I've ever heard. But I also heard Dr. Hill one day talking about how one day he had had a group of students from a, an institution of higher learning, a seminary as we call it, where they train pastors and ministers that was of a very cautious, even ultra-conservative bent toward the work of the Holy Spirit. These young students had been taught that things like speaking in tongues or praying for sick people or casting out demons, that those things are probably not for today. But because their church and their background carried the same name as his, they were in Los Angeles on a field trip and they came to church on Sunday morning. And as Dr. Hill talked about it, he said they experienced what he called showers of blessing. They had an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The choir was worshiping God. And some of them, just like on the day of Pentecost, were deeply impacted by the Holy Spirit. You know, as the Holy Spirit was poured out that day in Acts chapter 2, the crowd that came together looked and said, these people are drunk. Some people say, well, they said that because they were speaking in languages they'd never learned. Listen, I've never heard anyone drunk suddenly start speaking in a language they've never learned. And these were languages that were intelligible to the hearers on that context because they said, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And as the Holy Spirit was moving in that audience that day and people were worshiping God, not out of any desire to be disorderly, but they were caught up in the Spirit and some of them were doing what the Bible talks about in the book of Acts when it says Peter was praying on the rooftop and he went into a trance. Now, I don't know all of what that means, but I know he had a profound, genuine encounter from God, with God, that resulted in a mighty advance of the gospel of Jesus Christ as it was first taken to the Gentiles in the house of Cornelius. And that day at Dr. E.V. Hill's church, after they had had this unusual service where God had poured out His Spirit. You see, God is a God of order, but He reserves the right to sovereignly interrupt His own order and intervene in His own order and bypass His own order because He is God. He will never violate His Word, but His Word teaches us that the Holy Spirit is like the wind, like the fire, like the smoke, like water. Every symbol of the Holy Spirit in the Bible is an unstable element. 
What do I mean by that? I mean it can't be contained or programmed by human means. You can't take smoke and grasp it in your fist. You can't tell the wind which way to blow. Call it up on order. Man has tried to manipulate weather since the beginning of time, and unless God gets involved, we are mercy. We are at the mercy of the elements. We're at the mercy of weather. Jesus said to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, the spirit is like the wind that blows where it wants to, when it wants to, and all you can do is follow or discern the impact and the consequences of the spirit's moving. That day at Dr. E.V. Hills, he called these young preachers into his office, and he said. I want to ask you, what did you think about this morning? One person spoke up and said, "I thought that was uneducated ignorance." Dr. Hill said, "Okay, write that down. You're taking notes in this interview and going back to report to your class. You think that was uneducated ignorance?" He said to somebody else, one of the other students, "What do you think that was?" And one of those young men spoke up. He had been so brainwashed by some of his professors. Who taught him certain things in the Bible really shouldn't be there, and they wish they weren't there. If they were there, it's not for today; it's just for back then. And he said, "I think that's satanic worship." Dr. Hill said, "Satanic worship." He said, "Yeah." He said, "We had to carry some of those people out of the choir loft, and they were moaning and muttering in all kinds of languages. I think that was demonic." And Dr. Hill said. It was kind of funny to me that those demons were moaning, "Jesus, I love you." Oh, sweet Jesus, merciful Jesus. Anything supernatural that comes from God will glorify Jesus. You don't have to be afraid of anything that makes Jesus real. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Let's pray for some of the requests that have come in today as we go off the air, and we'll see you tomorrow morning right here on Word and Spirit at 9:30 every day this week. We're going to be talking about the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. We want to pray for Rick, who needs five hundred dollars before next Friday and healing from diabetes type two. Rick, we're going to pray for you. God can meet your needs. Just recently, Bobby called in, had a need. She asked us to pray. Didn't have any food or money, and just a short time later, somebody knocked on the door with a bag of groceries and gave her a hundred dollars. We're going to pray for you, Rick, today. We want to pray for Angela. We want to pray for Judy. We're going to be praying for you as we go off the air. God loves you. We love you. I'll see you tomorrow.